So we've started off today talking, um, we had Will and Josh earlier who were talking about um, things that they've achieved on their projects so far. Elliot did the review of the year. Um, I am now going to look into the future, which is um, not something we do very often as archaeologists. So, um, yeah, uh, interesting times. So um, this is something, as, as I'm sure you're all well aware, we, we um, celebrated our 10th anniversary last year which was brilliant and excellent. Um, and since then, we, in the office at least, have been thinking about what are we going to do for the next 10 years. Um, we are quite um, a thing to be celebrated within archaeology, to be honest. Um, very few community projects last as long as we have. Um, and often they are short-term projects that begin and end, and that's it. Um, so for us to still be here, still doing the things that we're doing, still have hundreds of people come to our events, thank you everybody, is a real achievement and we should all be proud of that. That is as much down to our volunteers and you guys who come to our events regularly as it is to the work that we do as staff and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that passion and determination and enthusiasm that you have and it is really, really appreciated. Um, so yeah, we've been looking and some of this stuff I'm afraid is going to be spreadsheets. Um, for us. But we've been thinking about what we're going to do next. This is just how you wanted to end this morning, wasn't it? <laughs> um, so we did some spend some time earlier this year um, doing various different things to talk to you guys, oh, well, to talk to frogs, to talk to our supporters, to talk to some mudlarks, to talk to people like Jane from Historic England, um, about what they think about what we do at TDP, what... Um, what we could be doing, what we could be doing better, why we do it. Um, so what I thought in this talk is I'm going to go through some of those things that you told us um, and what we did with it, I hope. Um, I'm, I'm not, not sure, sure if I'm making sense, sense yet, but hopefully I will start. Okay, so you may or may not remember, <laughs> back in April, because it was, seems like a year ago, because it's a whole <laughs> season away, uh, we did a frog survey. We sent out in the Frog Times uh, one month with a whole load of questions. Um, it went really well, actually, to be honest. We had a really good response rate. I'm a little bit of a geek when it comes to volunteer numbers, so you might need to shut me up, because um, I do quite like analysing this stuff. Um, and I would like to stress as well that surveys can only tell you so much, and we really appreciate the fact that so many of you would feel quite honest with us about your thoughts and feelings and will happily talk to us for a while on the foreshore sure about what's going on as well. And so we did a frog survey, we had a really good response rate, which we reckon was about half of all the active frogs who take part. I've done a lot of for, um, volunteer surveys in my time, and you're lucky if you get 15% response rate usually, so it's brilliant, it's a good sign, It's because it shows you're all engaged and interested. Um, and we had a really good, um, like high numbers of people who were very active, so 86% of people who took part in the survey had taken part in field work, 57% had been on a monitoring visit. And you rate us really well. On average, people said they gave eight, eight out of ten for the volunteering experience, um, which is good, really good. But actually, the most common answer was ten out of ten. Um, so that's really lovely. So thank you. Um, I've got fairy tales here because it's Christmas. Um, so this is um, Goldilocks trying out all the different types of bowls of pollo porridge until she found the one that she liked. Um, <laughs> it's like a survey, isn't it? <laughs> Of course, I try to make it interesting. Um, so, top five, ten, five reasons for volunteering. Um, and this is really interesting. Every single person who took part in the survey said they were volunteered either because they're interested in archaeology, or they're interested in London's history, or they're interested in the Thames. And an awful lot of people said all three. Um, no one didn't have one of those three reasons. That's important for us. Um, we, you, we had Will's talk earlier where he's talking about the planned future work we're going to be doing with um, various groups for the City Bridge Trust funding. If we're trying to broaden the reach of what we do with the project and bring new people in, we're going to start reaching people who maybe aren't coming with that initial interest in archaeology, but it might just be that they're looking for something to do. So we just need to think about how we manage that and, and we'll, how we present our projects to people to get them to the point where they are excited about archaeology or London's history of the um, The other next two were much further down the response rate, so only 40% of people, after all those 90s, said they're concerned about threats to archaeology from erosion and sea level rise, but that's still a big chunk of people um, and something that we're really keen on, and obviously it's becoming more and more obvious as time goes on. 
And also, close to 40% of people said it sounded fun, which is good. <laughs> I'm a bit worried about the most, the majority of you did so... Should have put a stop to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, the other interesting thing from a, a getting interested in volunteer figures time kind of way is how often do you volunteer return to discovery program? We've always had this very flexible model of volunteering, which is really good. Um, it means you can pick and choose when you volunteer and how often you volunteer. Um, and what it means is that the majority of, well, the, the most common answer was most people only volunteer a couple of times a year. So people seem really engaged in our project, but they don't do very much with us. Most volunteering um, projects that I know about, and I've compared some of this data to like national figures for people who volunteer in all different kinds of organisations. One or two days a month, or even one day a week or more, are much more common answers. So um, what that think that means is that there is capacity for frogs to do more on a more regular basis. <laughs> There's lots of nods in the room. It's <laughs> so it does it does it does, a double thing that we've been talking about is how what can we do to offer people so that there's more things for you to do and get involved with because obviously you've got the time um, compared to other <laughs> compared to other volunteering projects. Um, not everyone, and I do want to make sure we want to keep that flexible model because that works. I mean, I worked full time and volunteered with the frogs, so you know, being able to pick and choose how long I volunteered was perfect for me, and I know for an awful lot of other people as well. But it uh, does mean I think we have got some space, and I can see some people nodding in the room about that. Um, okay, this is quite a long list. So, well being, and this ties in with the work that Will wants to do as well. Um, just around half of the frogs who responded said that volunteering with TDP has a positive impact on their mental well-being and physical well-being. The other half of people said it didn't have any impact, not that it had a negative impact. I'd just like to make that clear. <laughs> 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 so so that's, that's a good thing. So, you know, at least half the people there. But what was also really important was we asked about specific well-being indicators, and a lot of people were responding to those. So um, seven, eight, almost 80% 80, 80 of people said the feeling of doing something meaningful or useful, and, and Will talked about that a little bit, about having a meaningful work and purpose and things. Um, my willingness to try new things, 70% of people said that. My ability to share my skills and experiences with others, pride in my local area, sense of being part of a community, my willingness to get involved in other things. So even though you might be feeling like, okay, it doesn't have that much impact on generally on my mental well-being or my physical <coughs> well-being, actually on specific things when we asked you about it, you did say, yes, it does. So that's really good, useful stuff. And that is the kind of thing we can put in funding bids and ask people to give us money. So thank you. And um, we also asked you what, how we could improve things. Um, and these are, these are kind of like, there were lots of, we left that as a bit, bit of an open question and loads of different answers came in and I kind of tried to group them together into categories and these are kind of the, the six overriding things. So one of those is timing of activities and that was about we don't go out at times that work for people. So it's early in the morning or it's not at weekends if you're working full time and that kind of stuff. So and some of that is you can't do anything about because it's the tides. I know. <laughs> so some of those answers that say they're going, well, yes, if you have control of the moon, maybe we could have some nice <laughs> midday monitoring visits. But yeah, but some of that is maybe we do need to think about spreading things out in different times, like evening events and day daytime events and things like that as well. So there's stuff to think about there. Ongoing support and training and <coughs> people helping to keep the skills and learn new skills and refresh, it's particularly refreshing fieldwork skills would like to remind everybody in this room that every year around about February time we do run a day's fieldwork refresher training. If you're a little bit unsure of what you're doing and recording on the foreshore, please do come along to one of those. And also, just to stress, any time we're out doing fieldwork and you're, you're not sure what you're doing or why you're doing it, feel free to come and talk to one of us. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, and we're more than happy just to refresh you on what you're doing or why you're doing it or just give you a few tips on how to do it better. Um, going back to the kind of frequency of volunteering and stuff, recognition and the desire to do more. People want to do more and want to be recognised for what they do. And that's um, definitely something to think about. Um, and actually stuff has already happened this year since the surveys come in place that means that more things are happening. So 
I'm really pleased this year that we've had a new frog group start in Deptford by Chris, who's here still, I think, somewhere. Yeah, she's at the back waving, so thank you so much for that. Um, so there's now five active frog groups, and last Saturday, every single one of those groups were out, were out monitoring, which is brilliant. Um, and I don't know if we've had that many groups out at one time before, so, you know, it was really nice. Um, we've also had the craft project, which is just kind of springboarded, which has been amazing to see, and loads of people have got involved, and I think because it's been asking people to do stuff in a slightly different way and stuff, people have been quite infused by that. Um, and we are, we've, we've, like Josh said earlier, we've got some early plans to maybe do some more stuff like that, but they're still very early days, so we don't want to, we'll, we'll let you know once things are more firmed up as well. A big question about what happens to the data. It's been a long being of frustration for us with collecting all this data for field work and for monitoring and what's happening with it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, communication, there were maybe some issues around communication um, and maybe that's something we need to think about is how we keep in touch with frogs, how do you find out what's going on, um, maybe we just need to remind people about, there's a lot of different ways to find out things, people do struggle with MailChimp and Ning and things like that um, and but then other people have no problem with them and also we have to have some kind of system and so it's kind of like how do we make this work. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll have to, um, we can't ring you all up to tell you about field work. <laughs> That's not possible. Um, and then also the monitoring process and support for the local frog groups. And I think there is more that we can do. And we have been trying to do more as well around that. Okay, we also asked some demographic questions and these were really interesting. Um, so on this graph, I'm going to get the pointer. This green line is the people who took part in the survey. No one aged between 18 and 25 took part in the survey. Um, and then it peaked at about 65 and then went down to 80. Um, however, this blue line is the people we trained over the last three years. This is the age of people we trained as frogs. So lots of 20 year olds, big jump at 30, a little bit of a dip at 40, then it picks up again at 55. So there's a big question here about what's happening here. So we were recruiting people here, but they didn't take part in the survey. And I'll be honest, they're probably not sitting in the room right now either. Um, now, one of the best things about having a flexible volunteering project is that people can pick and choose what they come and do. And I know that a lot of these people do come to field work, they just don't want to come and sit in a room on a Saturday listening to people talk. Fair, fine enough, you know, conferences aren't for everyone. Um, what is really interesting is, I told you I'm a little bit of a volunteering data nerd, is if you were to put this graph over a graph of people who volunteer across all sectors, what you get, what you will find is <coughs> actually, there is a bit of a peak of volunteers in around about age 20, because people volunteer when they're at university, when they're students. It dips down though, between 13, 14, 50, because people are working and they have families and they don't have time to volunteer. What's different about TDP is that we're recruiting people in that age group. When, like, and this is, you know, volunteering across huge, big organisations like Scouts and stuff struggle to recruit people with kind of age volunteers, but we don't. But what we might not be doing is keeping them. Um, so I find that quite interesting because obviously that's when I started volunteering and I've stayed, um, not just because I've got a job, but I would have carried on if it suited me. Um, so what I think we need to do is get some people in this group, age range, in a room and just have a chat with them and say, well, you know, why did you do the training? What do you want from volunteering with us? Is there anything we're missing? What, you know, is there more things that you need from us um, that we're not doing? Um, interestingly as well, um, is the um, ethnicity as well. So <coughs> our ethnicity data is interesting in that it's higher than average for the heritage sector in terms of diversity, and um, particularly um, people who aren't white at frog training, but we had no white people respond to the survey. Um, so again, there's a bit of a question there about we recruit people to do this, but they don't stay. 
So I think it's a similar thing if you're if you're not white and you're volunteering with us if, um, or you've done frog training, we're quite interested to talk to you about your experiences. And again, it's the things that we're missing that mean that you're um, not coming to other events and maybe not carrying on with field work after you've done the training. So yeah, um, interesting. Okay, so gonna get even more nerdy now. So the other thing that we did earlier this year and some people got involved with, we did a bit of a couple of focus groups to look at something called the theory of change. Um, big, and I thought this was a good idea to do this for TDP because we've been around for a while. Theories of change sound quite scary and they are a little, little bit confusing. confusing. Um, um, and, and I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm still, still not quite sure what they are. are and um, um, I know a lot of people who came to the focus groups probably weren't any clearer. Um, the <laughs> idea is, is they, they help you understand the difference you make as a project. It's all very well just going out and saying we're doing this stuff, but how do we know it's working? The different, you know, what differences are we making, not just to the archaeology, but to the people that are involved, to the wider community? What are we trying to achieve, you know, in the long term? Are we going in the right direction? So I've got Hansel and Russell following the thread into the forest here. <laughs> yeah, so the idea of the theory of change is it keeps you on track. It's kind of an ongoing changing document. Um, that helps you measure, like it gives you the things that you need to measure to see how, how you're changing. Um, and as we're a collaborative project, I wanted to talk to people because as staff, we think we've got an idea of what we think we're doing, but it was quite good to talk to other people to see what they think we're doing or what we could be doing. Um, so we came up with this, like I said, it's confusing. So we've got a column of things that we do. We said we do outreach, we do frog training, we do monitoring, we develop partnerships with lots of different organisations. So some of them are older people's organisations or veterans groups. It could be Historic England and so on, the Portable Antiquity Scheme. Um, these are the things that we do, produce. So we have research and data, and these are not too fun. We raise awareness of archaeology. We raise awareness about how to access the foreshore and people using the foreshore. We get people involved. Hi, thank you, everybody. And we're also monitoring erosion and loss and sea level changes and all that important stuff um, as well. And this is what we're trying to achieve. You know, in a hundred years' time, this is what we're hoping people will remember us for. Um, that Tens archaeology is known and it's valued and cared for, and especially by local communities, but also by policymakers and researchers around the world, perhaps. We understand the impact of climate change on archaeology. That's growing and growing and growing and really important. Um, and people are actively involved in the foreshore archaeology and they benefit from that involvement and it's a positive experience for them. So yeah. And this is potentially a changing document. We're gonna, you know, keep we have this but we'll keep looking at it. But what this means is that this gives us a kind of a framework to think about what we do. Okay, which means that we've been working on a strategy. Um, and so I've got um, here is um, Jack with the beanstalk being chased by the giant because Jack had a plan and he put his plan together and he defeated the giant and cut down the beanstalk. So that's, that's what, what we're, we're trying, trying to do as well. Um, so we've got a strategy, we're still working on it. We'd love to know your thoughts. Um, maybe we'll all go to the pub and get drunk and have a talk about it. Um, so we've got four strands to our strategy. One is about training, field work and monitoring carry on doing some of the things that we're doing, but maybe trying some new things as well. The big one is the data, so post-excavation, what do we do after the field work? The research and, and sharing those results, the dissemination. And we are actually actively going to work with Mona, we have been actively working with Mona to try and find funding to help support that. We're going to continue to do that. So touch wood, that will happen. We're trying to reach new audiences. So some of that work I was, I was talking about, about different ages volunteering and different ethnicities volunteering, uh, the work that Will's going to be doing with uh, mental health groups, with veterans, with older people, and also just thinking about the future and where the money is going to come from. MOLA are committed to supporting TDP for the future, which is great, but we could always do with more, so having a look around for opportunities and new ways of doing that as well. Thank <laughs> you.